Good morning, and God bless you all. Welcome, Lighthouse family and visitors. Thank you for joining us today for this virtual Sunday service. I want to share an encouraging word with you from Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. And so this, this is a reminder of God's might, his power, and why we should trust in him alone. The word says, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. As we see, the Israelites were faced with a very challenging circumstance. It was actually a life and death circumstance in their mind. Little did they know. However, they were not told to worry, to, to, to gather their thoughts, or to uh, calculate some plan and prepare for what God would do. They were just simply told to don't be afraid, stand firm, and to be still. As, as God word also says, his strength will be shown in our weaknesses. Father God, as we join together in worship and listen to your word today, I pray that you would open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to receive the message that you have for us. Father God, calm our spirit. Allow us to trust fully in you. Amen. Please enjoy the service. Living. 
Good morning. Good morning. God bless you. So excited to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, welcome. Today, we're going to get it started, and today's uh, sermon title is A Time for Revival. A Time for Revival. Today, we, we celebrate Pentecost Sunday, and, and we want to talk about revival today. Amen? Let's get started with a prayer. Father God, right now, we come before you. Lord, we come before you right now asking that you be in the midst of these words, each and every word that's spoken today, that it be your word. Lord, that these words may reach, Father God, that they may penetrate, that they may, they may uh, be absorbed and, and heard, Father God, by those listening today, that it may change their lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, so, many, people, so many people hear revival, and their mind automatically goes in one direction. I know that, you know, when I hear revival, uh, I have flashbacks or, or you know, uh, it, the word's been used so much, it's been misused so much, that when people hear revival, and, you know, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Uh, for some, it's, um, you know, some people, the like, first thing that comes to my mind is a service that's a week long, like every day for a whole week, that's revival. You know, um, they have a big banner outside, they have speakers outside, and, and, and they're having revival service. For some, they, they say revival, and, and it takes them back to childhood days when perhaps, you know, a big white tent was set up somewhere in the hood. And they had someone come in from out of town that was preaching, and, and, and really, really in such a passionate way, that, that perhaps many were trying to wonder what the preacher was saying because they were yelling and screaming and so hard that they were trying to figure out, okay, amen, amen, but w what exactly are you saying? And, and there was a lot of emotions involved. There were a lot of, you know, uh, ups and downs with emotions and, and, and all that. And so for some, when you hear revival, you think of things like that, a very energetic service with a lot of emotions, you know, uh, a very long service that may be drawn out for uh, a handful of days or that big white tent that was set up somewhere in the neighborhood, and you heard it for four or five blocks uh, away. But to be honest, though, have you taken the time to ask yourself, what is revival? Like, what, like, what does it mean? You know, um, revival means to bring back to life. To bring back to life. It means to restore, right, to restore consciousness. You ever hear someone that's drown, drowning and, like, they had to revive him, you know? They brought that person back to consciousness. It also means to restore to a previous condition. Now, in the context of the Bible, when we hear the words revival, you know, a lot of times it's talking about uh, restoration. Restoration. It also means rejuvenation. It also means the renewal of interest after spiritual neglect. The renewal of interest after spiritual neglect. If you guys can, I want you guys to turn with me to Psalm chapter 85, verse 1 through 7. Psalms chapter 85, verse 1 through 7. <clears throat> Lord, you poured out blessings on your land. You restored the fortunes of Israel. You forgave the guilt of your people. Yes, you covered all their sins. You held back your fury. You kept back your blazing anger. Now restore us again, O God of our salvation. Put aside your anger against us once more. Will you be angry with us always? Will you, be, pro, will you prolong your wrath to all generations? Won't you revive us again so your people can rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. This morning, I wanted to go through five points with you guys. Five points that if you truly desire revival, if you want to understand what revival is and you truly uh, want to experience it, I want to give you these five points for you guys to understand, to grasp, to take back, and really meditate on. The first point that I want to talk about is identifying and confessing your need 
for revival. So if you notice this, if you notice this, when the body is sick internally, when there's something wrong with you internally, we know that the body begins to show symptoms of the sickness that is inside of you. Many times, we don't, we're not aware of what we may have, but the symptoms will point to the direction of, uh, and, and help us figure out what it is. Some people have, co- have the virus from COVID-19, and there were symptoms that were related to that. You know, the fevers, the coughing, hard to breathe, you know, um, the taste buds not working and not being able to taste them. So these are symptoms. Some people don't know that they have the virus, but they have the symptoms of it, and therefore it makes them go to the doctor to see what they have. The symptoms are identifying that there's a problem internally. In the same manner, when there is a need for revival, there are symptoms that begin to show within your life. If you are in need of revival, there are some symptoms that will start to show that will identify the fact that the revival needs to happen in your life. So what are some of those symptoms? One, complacency. Complacency is one of the symptoms, meaning, hey, I'm fine with the way things are. I'm fine with status quo. Don't want anything to change. You know, um, uh, you know, sometimes they can be labeled the seat warmers, people that just come in, go out, come in, come out. They don't want to do anything uh, out of the routine, and, and they're pretty much just, hey, I'm here. Let's hear it. Let's sing a couple songs. I'm on my way home. And they've grown complacent. Another symptom that's there's, that shows that there's a need for revival is lack of concern. You know, as God's people, we should show uh, remorse or, 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 or be moved by, by what's happening in the world today. But if we notice, if we notice that, that we're not moved by the lost or by the suffering, like if that doesn't bother you, that there are people that at this moment, if they don't encounter Christ, that they will be going to hell, if that doesn't bother you, if that doesn't move you, then there's need for revival in your life. If it doesn't bother you, that there are people suffering. Revival is needed in your life. Another symptom is hiding or covering sin. Now, we're all sinners. We all fall short. But what I'm talking about here is is living a lifestyle of sin, knowing that it's wrong, doing it, knowing that it's wrong, and you keep telling yourself, you know what, a couple more months, and then I'll turn it in. A couple more months, and then I'll stop doing this. Maybe one more year and, you know, until I'm 35 or 40. And then after that, then I'll, you know, then I'll grow up. Then I'll, then I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll stop doing that, and I'll stop doing this. But in the meantime, you know, I'm just going to keep, keep on doing what I'm doing. It's the attitude of one day I'll stop. One day I'll give it over. But in the meantime, you're hiding it, and you're continuing it. How about an unforgiving spirit? An unforgiving spirit is another symptom that shows. We all hear it. We all heard that terminology, right, that says, I forgive, but I won't forget. Oh, my goodness. Forgive, but don't forget. Um, If I look at the Bible and I see what God does when I ask for forgiveness, Bible says that he takes, when I, come, when I come before him and I give over to him all my mess, all my junk, and I ask forgiveness, he takes my sins and he casts them as far as the east is from the west. At that moment, it's like a fresh start. If God is able to, 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 to cast that away and start fresh, are we not seeing him as the example? Are we not being able to do the same? Our sins against him are far more greater than the sins that we can do to each other. At that moment, at that moment, um, knowing this, this, having that theory of, you know, forgiving and not forgetting, the problem with that is, oh, you forget, but you don't forget. And then what happens is the way you treat people as a result of not forgetting is is a direct reflection of the fact that you haven't forgotten what they've done. So therefore, you say that you've forgiven them, but you still treat them for what they've done. Another another symptom that we need revival 
is pride. It's, it's having that feeling like I'm it, I made it. I'm irreplaceable. You know? Uh, it, was able to, it was able to function because I planned it out. It was able to work out because I was there to make sure things got done. It was able to, it was able to you know, you know I, I had these ideas, and because of that, we were able to reach the masses because of what I thought up. Again, pride is taking that flashlight instead of shining it on the Lord and shining it on yourself. A true symptom for the need for revival. Animosity toward other Christians. You know, I'm going to tell you right now, you know, we can choose who our friends are. We can. But you can't choose who your brethren is. When you come to Christ, you are not part of a family of brothers and sisters that all are serving the Lord. You can't choose who are your brothers and sisters in Christ. He does not desire that we have animosity against one another. So when you find yourself having animosity against one another within the body, there's a need for revival. When you find yourself in a condition spiritually that's less than before, there's a need for revival. You know, revival is needed when, God, when, when the hearts of God's people grows cold. You know, we see the need for revival in a world that lacks hope. We see a need for revival in our churches as they lack spiritual power. We see a need for revival in ourselves as we fail God time and time and time again. And we lack prayer. And, and, and for, some, for some reason, our testimony, our testimonies seem ineffective all of a sudden. There's a need for revival. As the verse uh, 6 says, revive us again. Revive us again, Lord, so that we can rejoice in you. The second point, the second point I want to make is this. You have to realize that revival is an actual possibility. You see, um, are we truly convinced that revival is possible? There are some people that believe, when they hear revival, they, they think of the Bible times. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was in the Bible times that they had revival. Oh, that's something that only uh, Pentecostals do. Oh, only, only Pentecostals experience revival. That's not for me. That's not for, for you. Oh, that's, that's only a certain group of people. It's only at a certain time of year. You know, it's only, it's only Pentecost Sunday. No, what happens is there are some people that have put limitations on this, and some people don't even believe in revival or that revival can come again. The second point is that you need to know that revival is possible. Yes, God can send and he desires to send revival again. This psalmist, the psalmist, uh, the psalmist 85, right? Uh, th- th- it, was, it was written by the sons of Korah. And at this moment, the, the psalmist, right, he was convinced. Six times in the first three verses, he reminds God of what God has done. He says, he says you poured out your blessings. He said, you restore the fortunes of Israel. You forgave the guilt. You've covered all sins. You've held back fury. You've kept back your anger. The fact that God has sent revival in the past shows us the possibility <coughs> that God can show, bring revival again. <coughs> but it's not just history. It's in his word, in his promises. He desires to send revival. The third point, we need to recognize the source of revival. We need to recognize where revival comes from. Take a look at verse 6 once again, and he says, won't you revive us again? Revival comes from God. Therefore, our eyes need to be set on God. Our eyes can't be set on man, on on, on methods, churches or denominations or organizations. Our eyes can't be set on that. If, if, If revival comes from God, why are we trying to figure out methods, methods 
and putting methods above his scripture, putting methods above what he requires in his word. Creating schools and teachings and all sorts of weird stuff that's not even in the Bible to teach certain things when this word is clear. When we look to man, we get only what man can give. When you look to money, you, can o- you get only what money can buy. When you look to organizations, you're only going to get what they can do. When you look to denominations, and denominations are not bad, but I'm just saying when you trust and you depend on a denomination for revival, you're only going to get what, the, what, what denominations say. But when you look to God, you will get only what he can give. Some of us have wasted so much time, so much energy, so much, so much focus on looking everywhere else for the revival that our spirit so eagerly needs in all the wrong places. Some of us are just completely spent because we've been doing, 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 thinking that doing is going to bring revival. And then we get worn out. The fourth point is that we need to commit ourselves to prayer. Commit yourself to prayer and submit your life to God. Submit yourself to God. So, so what is the secret of revival? You know, uh, it's not a, it's not a, a I can't, I'm not going to recommend going to a, a school of revival so you can figure it out. No, it's, it's a simple answer. The secret of revival is prayer. Prayer. In this Psalms that we read, we see a passionate believing, urgent prayer? Are you praying passionate prayers? Are you praying praying passionate prayers where you go before the Lord and, and you have these strong feelings of saying, God, you know my heart. You see what we see the injustices or you see what's going on. You see the need and, and you and you are you are like just passionately praying before God. Are you praying, believing prayers that when you go on your knees and you go before God the Father and you're putting these petitions before him that you are believing that he is hearing you, that you are believing that he's answering, that you are believing that your words are not just floating in space, but that your Father has heard each and every word, has saw each and every tear, and understands your heart. Are we praying urgent prayers, urgent, desperate prayers where we go before God and we say, listen, God, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing anyone can do but you. God, I need you. I need you to interfere. I need, I need you to do something. I need you to, 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 to interfere. I need you to, to come through. I need you to, to, do, to move this mountain. I need you, Father God. Are we praying urgent prayers? <laughs> Has there ever been revival? Has there ever been a revival without prayer? Has there ever been a revival that hasn't been the result of prayer, better said? The answer is no. No. Today we recognize the day of Pentecost, Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday. The disciples of Christ are in that upper room. First of all, out of obedience, being told to to pray and to wait on the comforter that that was being sent to them. And in obedience, they were there in that upper room praying. The word says that Peter stood up amongst the brothers and they were numbered of about about 120 of them. And then it says there, if you you read in, in in that chapter in Acts, it says that they continued in one accord in prayer and in supplication. They were praying in one accord. You know, it was then, 
it was then that the Holy Spirit rushed in and filled that, that place, that filled that room, and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was then that they were revived. It was then that they were empowered. It was then. How many of us need empowerment? How many of us are lacking that presence of God filling in place like the wind? If you look at certain famous revivals, you look at the Moravian revival, it started with prayer. The, the, the 1859 revival, it started with prayer. The Welsh revival, it started with prayer. I mean, I didn't want to get into all the, the people and who was doing this. And this. I, mean, I'm just, I just want you guys to see that these revivals started with prayer. The Pensacola revival, it started with prayer. 2 Corinthians 7.14 says this, Then if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. So what do I need to do? Humble? Be humble? Humble myself? If you're full of pride, you can't do that. Pray, seek God, repent, and then I can experience revival. I want you to know this. Our flesh, right, our body, this, this body that we're, that we're living in right now, it will naturally fight revival. This flesh will fight against revival. It will. You want proof? Okay. Ask yourself this. Ask yourself this. In your spare time, do you look forward to studying and praying, studying his word and praying in your spare time? Or do you find comfort and, and cares of the world, to cry, do you find that these comfort and cares of the world crowd out that time? They take up most of that time, and then what you're doing is you're scrounging to get a couple minutes here and there to pray, to read, check off the box that you read a chapter or you read a verse that day. Well, I, I, I prayed for four minutes this morning, so check. I read three verses through the Bible app, check. Are we praying and reading to just check off a checklist? Or do you, are you trying to get intimate with God? Are you trying to get to know him? Are you trying to hear his voice and, and, and let him lead you and direct you? Or is this all just a daily task? John 7, 38 says, Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. God wants to send revival, but he needs a channel. He needs a vessel. He needs you and me, believers. The question is, can he use you? Are you making yourself available to God so that he can use you? Lastly, the fifth point I want to make is that we need to remove the obstacles that are hindering revival. Do you know what the greatest barrier to revival is? Sin. Oh, but we're all sinners. I know. I know. But, but ask yourself, are you right with God? I mean, are, are you making a true and sincere effort to live according to his word? Again, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. You will make mistakes. We're not talking about mistakes. We're talking about making a choice daily to say, I'm going to live for God. Is there sin, is there active sin in your life that you keep putting aside and says, yeah, I'll deal with this one day, but right now I kind of like it. I know this girl's no good for me, but, <laughs> you know, the fun that we are having, 
you know, let, let, let me just, let me just kind of, you know, keep this going for a little bit longer before I got to repent. And then, you know, and then, and then I'll get my life right. Come on. I'm, I'm, I'm being straight up with you because this is what's happening. The church is not experiencing revival because so many of us are allowing sin to just dictate our lives. We're allowing ourselves to be, to, 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 to be a slave to sin when the word says that he, he wants to set us free from that. Are you living in disobedience? This is such a rebellious society. That's all we see. I was watching cartoons with my daughter the other day, and I'm like, did, did this cartoon just teach my daughter to not listen to her parents? To not follow the rules? It's starting from such a young age that society is saying, you don't got to submit to authority. Do what you feel is best in your heart. Do what's good for you. Look out for yourself. The things that we are learning in today's society go against the word of God. Submit to your authorities. Humble yourself. Do unto others as you will have them do unto you. So we don't live by that stuff anymore. No, we got to get mine before they get there. I got to get mine first and walk over whoever I have to walk over to get it. And if you ain't down with my plan, and if you're not down with what I want to do, then you're my enemy. This is what's being taught in society. This is what people are living, and this is anti, this goes against his word. It goes against his word. So, so what was Christ's intention? What was, what was Christ's intention when he addressed the seven churches in Revelations 2? And three, what was his intention? Let's, let's, just, let's just keep it simple. The simple answer is this. He desired to wake up the church. He desired for them to experience revival. But before they can experience revival, before they would be woken up, before they were woke, right? That's the terminology we use these days. Get woke. I'm woke. Are you woke? He wanted the church to get woke. And what happened was, before they can be revived, there were things that were hindering. There were things that they had to give attention to. There were things that they had to take out that were affecting the move of God in their churches. First, we see to the church at Ephesus. He makes the emphasis the fact that they've, they've left their first love. You know how it is. You meet somebody. You fall in love. Oh, Everything is about them. What they like to hear, you put on the radio. What, like, what they like to watch, you watch on TV. What they, what they like to smell, oh, you buy all the cologne and you put it on and you make sure you, you, drow, you drenched yourself in it because that's the cologne she likes. You eat all the nasty stuff just to impress her. Some people will put on a Yankees hat because their girl was from New York, even though they was from Philly, trying, you know what I'm saying? Don't worry, I won't say your name. I won't say your name. But the thing is this, when we are in love, we do whatever it takes. And he's addressing this church. And the Ephesus is like, you were once so in love with me. What happened? You grew away. You don't respect me the way you used to respect me. You don't honor me the way you used to honor me. You don't care about how I feel and what my word says anymore. To the church of, to the church at, at Smyrna, he says, "You have tolerated, you have tolerated her, uh, uh, heretic believers, believers, believers that are inside the church, causing uh, an array uh, 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 of confusion and and, and falsities and, and and leading people astray and causing divisions and doing all sorts of stuff within the body." And those those that are doing that are really, truly instruments of Satan. I didn't say it. It's in his word. To the church of Pergamos, members are following the doctrine of Balaam. You know, uh, they, they began doing things that they were told not to do. They were eating foods that were sacrificed to idols. They were committing sexual immorality. They had also submitted themselves to this false doctrine uh, of the, of the Nicol Nicolaitans. 
they could not experience revival in this state. To the church of Thyatira, you have listened and, and tolerated false teaching. You've committed spiritual and physical adultery. Now, we all know what physical adultery is. It's cheating, stepping out of your marriage, you know, being with somebody else that you're supposed to be with. You know, we, we know what adultery is. But spiritual adultery, what is that? Meaning that you've put some other God or person before God. You've cheated on him. To the church at Sardis, you think you are alive. <laughs> you think you're okay. You think that there's power here, but you're dead. You're dead. There's no spiritual life here. There's no power in this church. So he says to them, he says, be watchful, be strengthened. You lack power. You lack spiritual, uh, 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 you lack spiritual life in this place. You need to, you need to get back on it. You, you need to reconnect to the church of Philadelphia. He says, yes, yes, there's love amongst you. There's love. There's love. But beware. Be watchful that no one take your crown. That no one take your crown, implying that, that there would be people that would come to try to overthrow their faith. There would be people that would enter in and take stands that would want to uh, try to succeed in, in swaying them away from, from truth. He says, be careful. Don't let anyone steal your crown. Don't let anyone sway you to the left, to the right, take you off my path. Overthrow your faith. To the church at Laodicea, he says, repent. He says, repent. He says, the church has become lukewarm, neutral compromising. Do you know what it is when a church begins to compromise? When knowing that something is wrong, but not standing up for the injustice, knowing that something is against the word of God, but staying quiet, knowing when something is out of order to say, you know what, out of, out of the sake of peace, let's not address what needs to address. Let's just compromise with the situation and allow things to be even though we know it goes against his word, even though we know that it makes him unhappy, even though we know that he can't possibly be proud when he looks down upon us if we allow these things to continue in the condition that they continue. These were all addressed directly to those churches in those moments for what those churches were experiencing at that time. This we know. But the question is this, do, do, does any of that apply to me? Does any of that apply to me? Do any of these warnings apply to us? In closing, we need a revival that will restore joy and victory. We need a revival that will restore the joy and the victory. There are too many Christians defeated. There are too many Christians walking around discouraged. There are too many Christians going back to old ways and old habits and old traditions. There are too many Christians depressed. Lord, revive us. Revive us. There are some that feel there are some that feel like we need to get back into the church building. Oh, pastor, we need to get back into that building. And when we get back in that building, then there's going to be revival. You know, we'll, we'll experience revival when we get back. We don't need to be in this building to experience revival. You're wrong. Revival starts with you in your home, with your family. That's where revival starts. What good is it to go back to our church building? Tell me, tell, what good is to go back to our church building to sit together, to sing together, hold hands, if nothing is going to change? Church, hear me. Hear me out. 
What good is it to come back if the sick will still be sick when they walk in through those doors expecting a miracle, expecting healing? What good is it to come back if they're not healed? What good is it to come back if the tormented walk into those doors and can't be delivered? What good is it to come back? What good is it to come back if our families are still falling apart and there's no restoration of our homes? What good is it to come back if hearts continue to stay cold? What good is it to come back if people are not experiencing breakthrough and the power of God moving through their lives? What good is it? What good is it? being back other than the fact that the church can continue being a social club like it is for many what good is it other than the social club that it has become in many places i want to see revival in my life i want to see revival in my home i want to see revival in my church and i want to see revival in this city lord please send revival but it starts with us It starts with you. So church, those five points, we need to identify and confess that we need revival in our lives. We need to to realize that revival is truly a possibility. We need to understand who sends revival, where it comes from. We need to submit ourselves in prayer and to the Lord. And we need to remove any obstacles that are hindering revival in our life. It needs to be removed. And then, as a result of revival, oh, we will experience souls coming to Christ. Salvations. We will experience a peace beyond understanding in the midst of any pandemic. We experience glory. (laughs) We experience harmony amongst the brethren. We experience increase and provision. Church, the question for you is this. Do you want revival? Do you desire it? The answer is yes, and it starts with you. It starts with you. Father God, just thank you, Lord. I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to just be here, Lord, and, and, and hearing your word. Lord, as, as I was standing here, Lord, being a vessel used for you, Lord Jesus. Father God, Help us, Lord. For we are truly, truly in need of your help, of your spirit of revival. Lord, I don't want to keep moving forward without your presence, without the empowerment of your spirit. But I thank you, Lord, because I know you are up to something. I thank you, Jesus of what you're doing in the lives of those that are watching right now. I thank you, Lord, for the revival that is is beginning to stir up in in some homes and some families right now. Uh, A greater passion and love for you, for your word, for your presence, Father God. I thank you for that. I thank you, Jesus. Father God, I also thank you, Lord. I also thank you, Lord, for those that have lost those that are lost, that are finding their way to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, I just want you guys to know that that if you desire prayer, I know we're not in person, but I, I, I urge you, I urge you to reach out. Send me an email. You know, send the church an email and, and, and just let us know who you are what you need prayer with. If you want us to contact you, if you want me to contact you, leave your number there. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. I want to trust and believe for what God has in store for your life. God bless you, church. 
Uh, thank you for those that, that uh, uh, I'll see on Tuesday and for those that I'll see on Thursday at Bible study. God bless you. Have a great week.